Hi everyone, um, I am Katie. I'm just getting myself set up here. Um, I am a doctoral student at the School of Social Work at McGill and I'm here sort of to talk about my, ex I'm sort of gonna take a really deep, narrow dive into what it looks like to do this type of work on the ground. Lucy talked about sort of why we need to use population level data when we, use, when we make decisions, service decisions. And as a graduate student, when I first came into the program, I was super interested in understanding like what that meant when we were actually doing the work. Um, so I wanted to give sort of a case study example of how as a, as a student working with organizations and working with faculty members and sort of this university agency collaboration um, to come up with, to use administrative data to make service decisions. So I'm gonna make, sort of give a very specific example. Um, so the example that I'm using is, is, is sort of this concept of, of placement stability in care. Um, and it's a case study of a collaborative agency university partnership. So this is all under the framework of uh, the BRC, which is the Building Research Capacity with First Nations and Mainstream Youth Protection Services in Quebec Initiative. So it's a bit of a, of a mouthful. Um, but this is sort of a, a really big project with three main goals, which are to improve the child protective serv protection services available to children and families uh, in Quebec and sometimes you know, more broadly in Canada, uh, both for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children. It's sort of the language that was used 10 years ago when, the, when this was originally written. Um, and then to, yield, to use build agencies um, to build agencies' capacities to actually analyze their own data, to make use of the millions of data points that they collect every year and pour lots of resources into collecting so that agencies can actually use these to make service decisions. And then also to, say, to train researchers like myself um, to be able to work with organizations to be able to answer, help them answer the research questions that they have. So I think that a main point, something really important here, is that this is about collaboration and not consultation. So it's not about researchers going in and saying, we have this really interesting idea for a project that we want to publish in a paper and we want to use your data and we want to uh, you know, go sift through everything that you have and then at the end we're going to give you a two-page report on what we found. It is not the model that we're working with. It's really about going into an agency and saying, how can we help you answer the research, research questions that you have? Um, so that's sort of the starting place and that's where, why we consider it collaboration and not consultation. I think it's really easy to sort of go the consultation route and co collaboration is just a lot harder. Um, so it's really, this is about the, the research being driven by the needs of the agency and then ultimately by the needs of the children that are being served by that agency. Um, although OCAP um, is sort of, you know, it definitely comes out of working with First Nations communities, we think it's really useful for service communities in general to be going, to, you know, working with service communities, it, it's useful to use this frame uh, in all the work that we do. Um, so just in case you're not familiar, I mean, I think it's a lot of social workers in the room, and so I'm, I'm assuming you've heard the OCAP principles before, um, but it's really not about adjusting our work to make it acceptable to these principles, but being guided by these principles when, you know, from the second we enter the agency. So about ownership of knowledge and data and information, about control of that actual research process, um, agencies having access to their own data and deciding who has access to that data, and then the actual physical possession of that data. You know, we go into the, re into the agency and we use their data on their computers. We're not kind of taking it out, doing our own thing, and then walking back in two years later. Um, so the case study uh, is uh, understanding placement stability in long-term care. So I'm just going to sort of deep dive here to show what this process actually looks like, you know, for me as a graduate student. What did I do? Um, and how did I work with an agency to do that? Uh, so it, the context here is a large uh, child welfare agency in Quebec that mostly serves Anglophone and Allophone populations. Um, I can't pr use any real data, <laughs> unfortunately, so I had to kind of simulate data sets uh, to use in this presentation. Uh, we hopefully one eventually will have something more um, like, you know, it's a published report so that it can be useful across jurisdictions, but right now it's just not. Um, the, this slide is sort of what we know, what's motivating the research questions that the agency has. The we here is the agency and sort of, uh, and then us working with the agency and then what we want to know. So the, what we know is that children spend a long time in care and some move a lot while they're in care. So they experience a lot of instability in their placements. Um, and then we also know that placement stability is really important for development and well-being and we know that instability has negative outcomes. So that's what you know, the workers know, that's what the agency knows, that's what the research tells them, and it's what their clinical you know, knowledge tells them. 
Um, and then what they want to know is, are children at our agency experiencing instability? Workers feel like it is happening, but is this true? Is this sort of happening across the board? Or are there, there are a few extreme examples that we've seen that we want that are we're sort of like cluing into and, and putting all of our resources into resources into? And so then, if, if there is instability in our agency, what do these trajectories actually look like, and where can we intervene? Uh, in these trajectories to ensure stability. Um, so the agency you know, came to us and said, what do we, this is what we know, this is what we want to know. And it was our job to help them use their data to answer these questions. So um, the, the goal is sort of here of this presentation, which I'm already halfway through, but is, is to sort of show the interplay between research skills, you know, that the, that the community um, agency doesn't necessarily have, that the university, you know, that the, the university's te teams do have, um, and the interplay with that, those research skills with the clinical knowledge that the agencies do have and the, and the data that they do have. So it's using sort of, both of those are useful, but we have to make sure that we can maximize that collaboration so that, that we come up with you know, answers to the questions that agencies are looking to answer. Um, so it's about managing and analyzing that administrative data and having clinical and discussions so we interpret that data in the right way. Okay, so just you know, because this is the this is the the case study or the example, we're looking at placement instability, and this is probably pretty obvious to everyone. But um, when you know, whenever you start a research project or have a research question, you have to think about how you operationalize the key concepts that you're using um, in your in your question. So we, you know, the, we had to ask right when we walked in. We started using administrative data. We said, "What is a placement? What do we actually call a placement?" Um, so before we can know if a placement is unstable, we have to actually know what the agency considers a placement. So it's sort of where we started. Here's a fake data set, super simplified. If you've ever seen administrative data, which I'm sure most people have, uh, or, you need, or you've at least seen the forms that you fill out to create these administrative data sets, um, they're really complex, but I sort of boiled it down to some key information. So this is what the administrative data set might look like. And this is really purely financial information. It really doesn't give us a lot of clinical uh, you know, information. And a placement here is just a line on a table. So each line is a placement. And this particular table is organized so that we can see all the placements that started on March 17th, 2017. And just pretend that there were, let's say, 300 of these lines in this table. Um, and all this really tells us is that there was a particular bed at a particular setting that was occupied at a certain moment in time. Uh, and it really doesn't tell us much. It doesn't tell us anything about instability. It doesn't tell us about the child, you know, with this client ID, where were they before? Where are they going after? How long did they spend there? What was the stability of their, of their trajectory? Was it stable or unstable? Um, so our a data management sort of an, an analysis, analysis skills tell us that we have to organize this data by child rather than by placement. So that becomes sort of step one. Um, to understand instability, we have to understand trajectories over time of an individual child, not just sort of this placement level data. So our next move is into is to then dive into years worth of data and build a child level data set. So we come up with this, which is a data set organized by child. This is a very bare bones example. I won't get too technical, but basically we know how many placements a child had and what the sequence and duration of those placements were. So for example, the data says that child three had seven placements. It says the length of each one of those placements. Child one had six placements and child two had three placements. Um, so if our definition of instability, if you know, going in without any clinical understanding of the data, we'd say instability could be the total number of placements that a child has. If a child is placed in seven times, that sounds like an unstable trajectory. And so we, our goal is really to go through thousands of lines and sometimes millions of lines of data and categorize and count and come up with a system of saying whether trajectories are stable or unstable when we can't look at each child's trajectory. So how, do, how can we generalize from this data? And our challenge is that without clinical understanding of what these placements are, we can come to really wrong conclusions about instability. So this is a really basic example, but we sort of took this data set and we went to the agency and we said, talk to us about it. Tell us what these placements actually mean. Um, and without those clinical interpretations, we would have gotten everything wrong. So they really told us that, you know, coming in with some child welfare uh, knowledge, we, you know, we had a, a starting point here, but without these discussions, we would have gotten nowhere. So 
they pretty much said not all placements are, are created, at, created equal. Um, we can't count the placements and say the most number of placements means the most unstable trajectory. We have to consider where are people coming from? Where are they going? What are the reasons for the move? And how long are they staying in these different places? So instability really, really became about disruptions, significant disruptions in a child's life and not about placements. But how do we, you know, how do we, how do, we do that with administrative data? So when we, when we were thinking about it, we started to think about this poster on the wall metaphor, which is basically, you know, a, a significant disruption would be a child took their posters off the wall, packed up all of their belongings, left the home for good. That was it. You know, that's a significant, significant uh, disruption in a child's trajectory. Or did they pack a knapsack, go to camp for a week and come back to their home? That might look the same in an administrative data set, but has a very, very different meaning in a child's life. And so we needed to find a way to you know, systematically evaluate that it, when we're looking at, at hundreds and thousands of children over time. We sort of came up with a working definition of, of placement instability, and we decided how to categorize the data so that it could be used um, to get to this like, wider definition, this sort of population level um, analysis of instability. And so this is the same data that was on the last um, on the last slide, but here we've counted the total number of significant disruptions and not only the total number of placements. So whereas child three here seemed like the most, you know, if we had used our very crude measure of instability, child three would be the, you know, would, we would consider to have the most unstable trajectory. But you can see here that the child went from one foster home to camp, to foster home to camp, to foster home to camp, always to the same foster home. So every time they were returning to the same place over, and these are you know hundreds of days in between. So we have actually years worth of the child of data telling us that the child was remaining in a stable home, and that their disruptions were planned, they were anticipated, and the child returned back to where they came from. This child only has three moves, but they're to different settings each time, including a return home and an attempt at reunification with their with their family. So, you know, three moves, but very significant disruptions in that child's life. So this is sort of how we came up with a system for categorizing this data. Um, hopefully I haven't bored you to death with the technical details here, but I think it's important to understand how we can take these massive data sets and boil them down to what's clinically important um, and what's important at a systems level for making decisions. Um, and then you might say, okay, which we all did when we got to the point where we could categorize this, what about the quality of those trajectories? So maybe somebody has a, a really stable trajectory, but they're in just a bad setting the whole time. And that's the, that's the next step, you know, that's the next level, but we can't really know if we can ask that question until we've determined that there is stability or instability. Administrative data is really useful up to a point, and you need to know how to use it to be able to make it useful to an agency. And then, you know, that can motivate the next level of, of investigation. So, um, like Lucy was saying, popula population level knowledge is important to know whether this is a trend, whether this is so sort of a pattern in an agency, or something that are, is happening in some very few extreme cases. And if it is a trend and it is a pattern, we know that we have to, you know, pour resources into addressing that problem. Um, also, we can predict outcomes when we have, when we have uh, large data sets. We can say if someone has this type of trajectory, and we know that these, are, these could be the long-term outcomes of being in that, you know, having that type of trajectory. And then I think something that's really important here, and that I think that gets lost a lot in these conversations about administrative data, is this fiduciary duty to use this data. You know, we spend a lot of money, we spend a lot of resources collecting this data, and we tell children that we are going to do things that will, be, you know, we are going to make decisions clinically that will help them and future children that go through these agencies. And unless we're making use of the data that we do collect, we're not really doing them, you know, that service. Um, a lot of the time, we want to go right in and start asking qualitative questions. We want to start interviewing people about their lived experience in, you know, in foster care or in a residential home. But, you know, those interviews can be really difficult and really challenging for the children that are in care. So we have to know that our questions are justified before we go in and start asking them. Um, so I think that, like, I consider that a really important starting place is knowing, is this a problem we should investigate uh, deeper? And are these questions that we actually should be asking uh, children and their families to talk about? Um, so my, you know, basic takeaway uh, is that collaboration is iterative. It's a lot of back and forth. Uh, it's hard work. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy. Um, and it's really important thing to get things right, to be able to make you know, the right clinical decisions. Um, and that we really need to move, as you were saying, you know, move past this quantitative qualitative divide and find out what the data that we have, how that data is useful uh, and use it for those, you know, for those ends. 
Uh, that's it. <laughs> okay. I also realize I talk really fast, especially when I'm nervous. <laughs> so <laughs> I can, you know, slow down and re-explain if anything. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, to move on? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm very happy to talk about this. Okay. Thank you. I was going to say, when it comes to um, quantifying trauma, I think that's almost like an impossible task in many ways when you're dealing with these individuals who come have these significant changes, and then like you said, you put them in the database, like what does that really mean? And when you go back and revisit that, you have to take into account what were these transitions, what happened in between them, and how are they feeling, and yeah, it's, it's complicated, I don't even know how you can... There are always assumptions, yes. you have to render explicit what your assumptions are, right. and see if there's a way of tackling them. There's always assumptions. And know what you will get out of the data and what you absolutely will not get out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, find, um, I found this interesting because you take something that seems so simple, place of, place of moves, and how do you count that? And you know, when you look at the data, what does it mean? Because sometimes in, you know your electronic client record, even if you just change the address because there's a typo in it, it can get calculated as a place of move or a change in placement. And it's interesting that, you know, you went through this, you explained that even defining placement, the definition of, well, what is a placement, so important. And then for that agency, whichever agency you work with, to take that information back, and maybe if they're going to develop a new electronic system or information system, then develop things in that so that they can pull out their data better, easily, and even to give notifications back to the social workers or supervisors to advise, hey, look, this child is under five, they've had two placement moves in the last year, or is under six and has had three placement moves, so send those notifications back so you can use the system to work, you know, in clinical practice in that as well, right? That's exactly the goal, that captures it beautifully. And I think it's interesting because it took, you know, almost a year for us to get to the point where we could actually look at a line of data and say this should or should not be counted. Yeah. And, you know, hours worth of discussion because, you know, the, the date, like you said, the date, the placement place stays the same, but, you know, financial detail changes. And it looks like a move and it's not a move. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's messy work, yeah. but it, if we can do it right, then we can use it for, for service. Yeah. And, and do the clients and merging all that information and, you know, have that control range in your data. Yeah, yeah. And, but the, I think the shame is that a lot of agencies just don't have the capacity and the resources to actually do this with their data. Yeah. So our goal from the outside is to try and help them that.